Hello, I'm JP from the Way Biblical Fellowship, and this week's Torah portion is called Violek. This is the Torah portion in which we have the death of Moshe, the appointment of Joshua to lead them over into the Promised Land. This is where the Torah has been leading to. What we'll have a look at is some of the prophetic pictures that are drawn from this Torah portion. I hope you enjoy it. Shabbat Shalom. Okay. Torah portion, Violek, and it means when he went out. Okay. Anyone guess from the picture what happens in this week's Torah portion? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So today is the day when Moshe will die. He admonishes us over and over to keep Torah. Okay, you might think it's a little bit like being at this church. It's almost like when he desires to do so, that he desires to do so with his last breath. Okay, all the way through the Torah portion. He knows that he's going to die and he admonishes people over and over, keep the Torah, keep the Torah, keep the Torah. So it starts in Deuteronomy 31 verse 1 and it says, So Moshe went and spoke all these words to Israel. And he said to them, I am 120 years old today, and I am no longer able to come and go. And Yehovah has said to me, you shall not cross this Jordan. Now this is interesting because he says this, I am 120 years old today. Now, does he mean at this time I'm 120 years old? Or does he mean today I'm 120 years old? It's not clear from the text, okay? People think both ways. But it's quite possibly that it's his birthday today. So Moshe lived 120 years old, which is three periods of 40 each. 40 is a number that accompanies trials and testing in the scripture. Okay, you've got things like Yeshua in the wilderness, okay? 40 days. But whenever you see the number 40, trials and testing accompany it. Now Moshe's life was neatly divided into 40 year periods as well. He lived 120 years, three periods of 40 years. At age 40, he killed an Egyptian and was forced to flee to Midian. Okay? First 40 years of his life, he lived in Egypt. And he killed an Egyptian, went to Midian. From 40 till 80, he was a shepherd in training. Okay? He was a shepherd for uh, Yitro sheep in Midian. At age 80, he became the shepherd that led the Israelites out of Egypt. And the last 40 years, definitely time to testing and trials. Now at 120, he is ready to transition out of this physical world. And he's got no qualms about it. Just Yehovah tells him he's going to die. He goes about his business until he dies. In Exodus 2 verse 10, it says something interesting. It says, and the child grew, talking about Moshe, and she brought him into, unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called this name, Pharaoh's daughter, Moshe, and said, because I drew him out of the water. Okay. So it was Pharaoh's daughter, it was an Egyptian that gave Moshe his name. Moshe doesn't actually have a Hebrew name. So Deuteronomy 31 verse 2 mentions what turns out to be the reoccurring theme of crossing over. Okay, it says this. It says, you shall not cross this Jordan. And all the way through scripture we get this idea of crossing over. Okay, a crossing over that occurs. So this Hebrew word avar, the crossing over, is actually the root of the word Hebrew. And to become a Hebrew, one must cross over. Abraham was the first to be called a Hebrew. Genesis 14, 13 says Abraham the Hebrew. This concept is not hard to grasp, this concept of crossing over. Simply means to leave one side of the river to go to better soil. We're all Hebrews, we've all crossed over from kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We can understand that, it's simple. Today, if we want to become a part of the family of Yehovah, we must cross over. We must do the same. We must be a Hebrew. 
This is a picture that's vividly painted in Yeshua's words in John. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Okay, so we see the concept there of this crossing over, okay, this transition that's made. So what is it to be a Hebrew? If we are all Hebrews, what is a Hebrew? What's meant by the term Hebrew? Okay, one who is separated. These are all various ways of translating or taking the concept from the word Hebrew. One who is separated, one who lives on the other side, one who is independent or stateless, one who is migratory, beyond, can be translated as one who is beyond, one who is a sojourner on the earth, one who is passing through, as distinct from a settler in the land or a resident of the nations, one who stays there, okay? We all have this kind of feeling that we're, we're just passing through, that we're aliens in this land. Descending either behaviorally or genetically from Eber, the, um, following the path of Abraham, living according to the holy instruction of the God of Abraham, Yehovah, okay? Hebrew is actually derived from the name Eber, so let's look at Eber. Noah's son Shem begat Eber, so this is Noah's grandson, who Abraham is descended from. Eber is said to have resisted Nimrod's command to build the Tower of Babel. And as an act of disloyalty to Nimrod, Eber crossed over from Babylon to the land across the river. Now, I don't know if this is true. This is just what his people say about him, okay? About what his descendants say about him. But I think that it's interesting that he went against Nimrod's com command. He went against the commands of Babylon and he crossed over, okay? In the wilderness, Eber and his people retained the Hebrew language, while back in Babylon, the rest of the languages were confused. Again, I don't know if this is true. This is just what his descendants say about him. The name Hebrew rested on Abraham, whose name comes from that of his ancestor, Eber. Abraham and his sons, Isaac and Jacob, distinguished themselves as men who would migrate away rather than fight over territory, okay? All three of them did the exact same thing. Okay, anyone think of when Abraham left rather than fight over territory? Okay, it was when he left Lot. Okay, there was a dispute over the best pasture land and he, rather than fight with Lot, he just said, you know what, you, you have that land, we'll just go over here. Okay, Isaac, okay, I'll be impressed if anyone thinks of uh, the one with Isaac. It's, um, when he left Abimelech, made the covenant with Abimelech, rather than fight over the wells that Abraham had dug, he left and went somewhere else. And Jacob, more, more obvious one with Jacob, he left rather than fight with his brother Esau, he went into exile. Okay. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all crossed over from their homeland to new territory rather than fight, even when it meant leaving behind their extended families. I think this is an interesting thing for us at the moment, okay? We feel a calling to possibly leave where we are now, possibly leaving behind extended families rather than stay and take up the sword and fight, okay? There's three, three options that are given in Scripture for the end days. Those who go into captivity, those who take up the sword and die by the sword, and those who are protected. We likewise are called like Eber to separate from and refrain from participation in the nations of the world. Hebrews sometimes lived in villages and raised livestock, seasonally grazing them in drier areas which didn't farm well, a form of subsistence to how they lived, known as transhumans. Okay, Charlie, you like this? So they were, they could have been described as transhumanists. Principally, goats and sheep and cattle, their beasts of burden, the ones that did the work were oxen, donkeys, and later camels were introduced from Central Asia. Okay, so these are the people that we are descended from, at least spiritually, that we take our spiritual identity from. Verse 3 says, It is Yehovah your God who will cross ahead of you. He will destroy these nations before you. You shall dispossess them. Joshua is the one who will cross ahead of you, just as Yehovah has spoken. And I think this is, this is interesting, because it says two 
different, seemingly contradictory things. It says, Yehovah, your God will cross over before you. And then it says, Joshua will cross over before you. It is him that does it. It is Yehovah who does it. Now, I think this is an allusion to the fact Joshua, Yehoshua, later called Yeshua, okay? That Yeshua is being a link there, made with him and God. It's not the only time in scripture that someone called Joshua, that there's a link between him and Yeshua. Okay, in Zechariah 6, 11 to 13, it says this, this is an odd account. It says, take the silver and gold and make a crown and set it on the head of Joshua, Yeshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh Yehovah Sevoot, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of Yehovah. Now, this is being declared over Joshua the high priest. And up to this point, he probably thinks, Yep, that f- kind of fits. I don't know what he's talking about with the branch, but Joshua did actually come and build the temple of Yehovah. Okay, prophetic picture there, obviously, but he would have been with him so far. But verse 13 says, Even he shall build the temple of Yehovah, and he shall bear the glory. You'd be thinking, bear the glory of the temple? What are, what's he talking about? And rule upon his throne. I'm going to rule upon my throne. And this is being declared over the high priest. It's not relevant to him at all. And he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Okay, this is obviously a prophetic statement. He's making a declaration over Yeshua, the high priest, that he will sit on his throne. Okay, verse four says, Yehovah will do to them just as he did to Sion and Og, the kings of the Amorites, and to their land when he destroyed them. Yehovah will deliver them up before you, and you shall do to them according to all the commandments which I have commanded you. Okay, this idea of them going across the land, this again is a prophetic picture we see in Revelation across the Jordan. Okay, we are led so far by Moshe. Okay, we're led so far by Torah, and then we're led into the land by Yeshua. That's the prophetic picture, and this is what Revelation says about that event. Verse 11 of uh, chapter 19 says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, the white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had the name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, and the heavens which were, uh, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that it that with it he should smite the nations and he should rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. So this is what happens when Yeshua leads us into the land when the armies are encamped around Jerusalem, okay? Yeshua comes and he conquers them. Verse six says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them for Yehovah your God is the one who goes with you. Okay, obviously we see the prophetic picture of Yeshua going into the land before us. He will not fail you or forsake you. Then Moshe called to Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, be strong and courageous for you shall go with this people into the land which Yehovah has sworn to their fathers to give them and you shall give it to them as an inheritance. Now, this is very similar to a piece of scripture that Charlie was given when he first realized that the Torah still stood and he had lots of people who were coming against him and challenging him. This is the piece of scripture. It's in Joshua. Okay, it says, Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moshe my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth but thou shalt meditate therein day and night 
that thou mayest observe to do all according, according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and, and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for Jehovah thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Okay? His strength is in the book of the law. His strength is in following Torah. We can see that from these words. Strength and good courage is chazak and amatz in Hebrew. Now, chazak is often translated as strength, but the strength Moshe is talking about is not self-generated or contained strength. It is not strength in isolation. Might be, yeah. Might be disappointed to hear that, Charlie. Well, it's okay because you've got the strength that it's actually talking about. The Hebrew verb means to tie tightly or bind fast. The kind of strength Moshe prophetically declared over Joshua, therefore, was a strength derived from being tightly bound to Yehovah and being bound fast to the Torah. Okay, knowing that if he's doing God's will that absolutely nothing can come against them. The only time that the enemy can come against you is when you step away from God's will. Joshua's strength was to come from the fact that his will was completely subordinated to Yehovah's will. Emat, okay, it's often translated as good courage. The Hebrew verb, however, means um, alertness of mind, resoluteness of spirit, and swiftness of foot. Okay, so it's saying basically, do the Torah, get your strength from following God's will, and be alert of mind, do it, do it well. Verse 8 says, Yehovah is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you, nor uh, do not fear or be dismayed. So Moshe wrote this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of Yehovah and to all the elders of Israel. Now when it says here, Moshe wrote this law, I doubt that this is talking about the entire Torah. Because if at this juncture Moshe wrote the entire Torah and gave it to the priests, then that would have taken him about six months to do. That's how long it takes to write a Torah scroll. Okay, this is the law that I think it's talking about. Some people say it's just talking about the book of Deuteronomy. Some say, people say it's just talking about the entire Torah. This is the law that I think it's talking about. Then Moshe commanded them, saying, at the end of every seven years, at the time of the year of remission of debts, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before Yehovah your God at the place which he would choose, you shall read this law in front of all Israel in their hearing. I think he just added this, this one law. This is the law that's relevant to us at the moment. Okay? Saying, at the time of the year of remission of debts, that's the Shemitah year. By all estimations, it's probably the Shemitah year this year. Okay? There's certainly the crops that were in the land were three times as abundant last year as in other years, which happens before the Shemitah year. Okay, and all records show that this is the Shemitah year this year. It's saying, at the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles, read the Torah. And you've got to imagine that these people were, they were farmers, okay? Um, they didn't have a Torah scroll for themselves, so they would hear the law being read once every seven years, so they would know exactly what the Torah of God was. So we'll be doing this this year. I don't know in what form we'll be doing it, whether we'll read the entire Torah, Genesis to uh, Deuteronomy, all the way through, or just the law that Moshe gives in Deuteronomy, or whatever way we'll do it, we'll be doing this. So it should be good. We'll uh, get to read and discuss the Torah. Okay, in Zechariah 14, 16, it says something interesting. It says, And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem, so this is talking about in the millennial kingdom, shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, Yehovah, Sevoth, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. So everyone on the earth will have to come up and keep the feast of tabernacles. And it says that they will not receive rain in their countries if they don't come up and keep the feast. But if they're coming up to keep the feast every year, and every seventh year, the Torah is read. That means that the nations will come up to Jerusalem and hear the Torah being read in the millennial kingdom. It says that the Torah will go forth from Zion in Isaiah 2. 
Okay, verse 12 says, Assemble the people, the men and the women and the children and the alien who is in your town, so that they may hear and learn and fear Yehovah your God, and be careful to observe all the words of this law. Their children who have not known will hear and learn to fear Yehovah your God, as long as you live on the land which you are about to cross the Jordan to possess. Then Yehovah said to Moshe, Behold, the time for you to die is near. Call Joshua and present yourselves at the tent of meeting that I may commission him. So Moshe and Joshua went and presented themselves at the tent of meeting. Yehovah appeared in the tent in the pillar of cloud, and the pillar of cloud stood at the doorway of the tent. Yehovah said to Moshe, Behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers. Okay, so he said, You're about to die. Okay, now, I, have, I saw something by Rabbi Foreman. And he was, he was uh, saying, what, what would you expect God to say to Moshe at this point? Okay, and this is what he says. Dear Moses, thank you for all your hard work. You were the best man for the job and no one could have done it better. I hate to see you go. All the best, God. Okay, you'd expect him to say something like that. This, that's not what he says. This is what he says. He says, and this people will arise and play the harlot with the, with the strange gods of the land into the midst of which they are going and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. In other words, all the hard work you've done, everything that you've done up until this point, it's going to be for nothing because when you're dead, they're all just going to rebel against me, go against me completely. Then, it gets worse, my anger will be kindled against them in that day and I will forsake them and hide my face from them and they will be consumed and many evils and troubles will come upon them so that they will say in that day is it not because our God is not among us that these evils have come upon us now this here is it, is it not because our God is not among us that these evils have come upon us so what they're doing at this point is they're not repenting they're saying, all this evil's come upon us because God's turned his face from us. They're not saying, God's turned his face from us because we've been evil in his sight. They're blaming God, basically. The second time he says it here, but I will surely hide my face in that day because of all the evil which they do, for they will turn to other gods. So without repentance, he's not going to turn his face from them. He's going to continue hiding his face. Number 626 shows us that it's a good thing to have Yehovah's face turn to you. Okay, this is part of the ironic blessing. It says, Yehovah, lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Okay, they, they're synonymous with each other. His countenance is upon you, you have peace. He turns his face away from you and all that calamity comes upon you. In uh, Nehemiah 1.9 it says, But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do, do them, though they were cast of you, uh, sorry, though they were of you, cast out unto the uttermost part of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now this is very, very important because this gathering is something yet future. And he says, if you turn to me and keep all my commandments, as he said last week, if you keep the book of the law in the future, and you turn to me at that point in the future, if you keep the book of the law, then, then I will gather you back to myself. Okay? So it's important that we recognize that these commandments that we're being told to observe so that he'll turn back to us are the book of the law, They're the entire Torah. Okay? Isaiah 54 verse 5 to 8 says for thy maker is thine husband so this is addressing the bride Yehovah Sevaroth is his name and thy redeemer the holy one of Israel the God of the whole earth shall be called for Yehovah hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth when thou wast refused saith thy God for a small moment have I forsaken thee but with great mercies will I gather thee. So this is a, a promise to the bride that he will gather the bride. In a little wrath, I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith Yehovah thy Redeemer. Because the bride turns back to him and starts following everything that he has commanded. So Yehovah is not going to cause his people to repent through human ministry. That's not what he says they'll do. Okay? 
You know, has got a different way of doing things. He knows that it's just not going to listen. Oh, what to my man? Well, it doesn't matter. It is through a series of trials and tribulations, disasters and calamities, that he will cause them to repent. There's actual consequences in their life. So they'll cry out to God when things get really terrible on the earth people will cry out to God and say actually we want your righteousness now his explanation of this begins with a very strange statement he declares that when people abandon him his response will not be to go chasing after them instead he says my anger will be kindled against them in that day and I will forsake them and hide my face from them and they will be consumed and many evils and troubles will come upon them and basically They've got the choice all along. The commandment which they've heard from the beginning. Do this. Don't do that. Calamity and trouble will come upon you. Here is how his people turn from him. Even today. Okay. His people will turn from him. Isaiah 28 verse 7 says this. For they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. Okay. Wine and strong drink are talking about the false doctrines that make people drunk as opposed to the water of the word. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Okay, the priest and the prophet, the ones who are teaching the prophets of God, will err through this wine and strong drink. Through this false doctrine, they will err. Isaiah 29, 9-10 says, Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine, not with real wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For Yehovah hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers hath he covered. So Yehovah will do this, okay? People want to rebel against him, then he will... Bring about this delusion, this spirit of deep sleep as it calls it here, okay? And the prophets will be deceived. Hosea 4, 10 to 12 says, For they shall eat and not have enough. They shall commit whoredom and shall not increase because they have left off to take heed to Yehovah. Whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart, okay? Wine being doctrine. This new doctrine that comes about takes away the heart of God's people from what he's been saying all along. Keep my Torah, okay? He'll bring signs and wonders to say, oh, you know what? You just want to stray from my Torah. Ah, oh, it's fine. My people ask counsel at their stocks and their staff declared unto them for the spirit of whoredoms hath caused them to err and they have gone a whoring from under their God. Okay, this is something that Yehovah just allows for his people to be deceived by these things, to be deceived by these spirits. He brings it upon them because of the rebellion of their heart, because this doctrine has taken away their hearts from him. Micah 2, 11 to 12 says this, If a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink, he shall even be the prophet of this people. Okay, so let the people have this false prophet. But this is directly compared with verse 12. It says, I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. Okay, so you've got one group on one hand that's going after this spirit of falsehood. You've got the other group on the other hand, which he says, I will gather thee. I will put them together as the sheep of Bosra in the flock in the midst of their fold. We know Bosra is the sheepfold. Okay. They shall make great noise by the reason of the multitude of men. 144,000. Okay, verse 19 says, Now therefore, it's interesting that he says therefore at this point. He said, they're all going to turn from me. But therefore, write this song. In other words, this song is a a response to the fact that they're going to turn away. Now therefore, write this song for yourselves. Now this song, we'll we'll be hearing it next week. Basically, it gives a history of Israel. And it tells him basically all the stuff that they did wrong. So when they say it's because God has turned his face from us, 
Therefore, write this song so they can see all the stuff that they've done wrong so they can repent and turn back to God. Now therefore, write this song for yourselves and teach it to the sons of Israel. Put it on their lips so this song may be a a witness for me against the sons of Israel, okay? A witness against them is not a bad thing, okay? It's only a bad thing if they are in rebellion. The witnesses are necessary. For when I will bring them into the land flowing with milk and honey, which I swore to their fathers, and they have eaten and are satisfied and become prosperous, they will turn to other gods and serve them and spare me and break my covenant. Okay, there's people who are doing that today. They don't worship the God of the Bible. They worship a God of their own imaginations, a God that they're more comfortable with. Verse 21 says, Then it shall come about when many evils and troubles have come upon them that this song will testify before them as a witness for it shall not be forgotten from the lips of their descendants for I know their intent which they are developing today before I have brought them into the land which I swore. So Moshe wrote this song the same day and taught it to the sons of Israel. Then he commissioned Joshua the son of Nun and said, Be strong and courageous, for you shall bring the sons of Israel into the land which I swore them, and I will be with you. It came about when Moshe finished writing the words of this law in a book until they were complete, that Moshe commanded, that's another reason why I think that it was the final law that he wrote in the book, that Moshe commanded the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of Yehovah, saying, Take this book of the law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of Yehovah your God, that it may remain there as a witness against you. So the book of the law is a witness against them as well, but it's only a witness against them because of their wrongdoing. Okay, the idea that the book of the law is a witness, so it's a good thing to do away with. Well, let's get the Song of Moses as well. Let's do away with the Song of Moses. Okay, these things stand as a witness against them because of their rebellion. For I know your rebellion and your stubbornness. Behold, while I am still alive with you today, you have been rebellious against Yehovah. How much more then after my death? Okay, we don't want these things to be a witness against us. and We just need to stop rebelling against Yehovah. Assemble to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers that I may speak these words in their hearing and call the heaven, heavens and the earth to witness against them. Okay? Three witnesses. Okay? Two or more witnesses to establish a matter. I'm not going to get the heavens and the earth, the book of the law, the song of Moses. You just do away with all of them because they're witnesses against us. That's not, not what you do, is it? Okay? You don't want something to be a witness against you and don't commit the crime. Verse 29 says, For I know that after my death you will act corruptly and turn from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days. For you, in the latter days as well, you will turn away from these things in the book of the law that I have commanded you in the latter days. For you will do that which is evil in the sight of Yehovah. Breaking the book of the law is doing evil in the sight of Yehovah. Provoking him to anger with the work of your hands. Then Moshe spoke in the hearing of all the assembly of Israel the words of this song until they were complete. Now, in Isaiah 42, 10 to 11, it says, Sing unto Yehovah a new song and his praise from the ends of the earth that ye go down to the sea and all that is therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof. Let the wilderness and the cities thereof lift up their voice. The villages, uh, the villages that Kedar doth inhabit, let the inhabitants of the rock, okay, the inhabitants of Selah, it says in the Hebrew, the inhabitants of Petra, let them sing and shout from the top of the mountains, okay. So this is the new song that is sung by the inhabitants of the mountains in the days when Yehovah is Uh, judging the earth and the people are protected. This means that we can identify who these people are that are singing this new song because it says this in Revelation 14. It says, And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard the voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of great thunder And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne. Okay, so in scripture we have the two witnesses. 
two times when this new song is talked about. One, it says that they are the inhabitants of Silah, the inhabitants of Petra that are singing it. In this verse, it says, and they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song. Okay, so it's no one else can sing this song for the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Okay, so the ones who are in Selah that are singing the song for the 144,000. Okay, shall we pray?